الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الذين يؤذون الله ورسوله لعنهم الله في الدنيا والآخرة وأعد لهم عذابا مهينا صدق الله مولانا العظيم وصدق رسوله النبي الكريم الأمين ونحن على ذلك لمن الشاهدين والشاكرين والحمد لله رب العالمين قال الله تبارك وتعالى في شان حبيبه صلى الله عليه وسلم مخبرا وآمرا إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا ومولانا محمد وأصحاب سيدنا ومولانا محمد وبارك وسلم وصل عليه الصلاة والسلام عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله الصلاة والسلام عليك يا سيدي يا نبي الله الصلاة والسلام عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله وعلى آلك وأصحابك يا سيدي يا خير خلق الله Most Honorable حضرات علماء الكرام Respected elders, youngsters and brothers in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته With the grace of Allah Almighty, we are present here in this most auspicious occasion entitled Banati Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Conference, which has been convened by my Honorable Brother Mawlana Muntasir Hussain Sahib, may Allah Azza wa Jal accept his efforts and may Allah Azza wa Jal increase his work rate and may Allah Azza wa Jal increase his rewards and give him the barakah of both worlds, the dunya and the akhirah. This title, Banati Rasul Conference. Banat, for those of you like myself not very familiar with Arabic, Banat is the plural of bint, which means girl, and is used also for a daughter. So Banati Rasul, which is the plural of the word bint, would be translated as the daughters of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Before me, Hazrat Malana Sahib Zada Dilshad Hussain Sahib Qadri, who is the khatib of this mosque, and Hazrat Malana Qari Muhammad Ejah Sahib, who is the Imam of this masjid, both have given us an introduction into the topic. <coughs> and before me, my brother Maulana Muhammad Nareed Siyali Sahib also said a few words in both Urdu and English. And present on the stage are our main guest English speakers, namely Maulana Munawar Atik Sahib and Maulana Ghulam Rasul Sahib, who inshallah ta'ala will give you inshallah most um, enlightened bayan in the praise of Banati Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. My task was to speak on 
the eldest of the daughters, Sayyida Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha. The words which I recited in my introduction in the khutbah, Allah Azza wa Jal has stated, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يُؤْذُونَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ Indeed, those who cause grief and pain to Allah and His Messenger, لَعَنَهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ Allah Azza wa Jal will curse them in the dunya, in this world, and the akhirah, in the next life. وَأَعَدَّ لَهُمْ عَذَابًا مُهِينًا And Allah has prepared for them a most painful and humiliating torment. There is a section of people who say that the Prophet ﷺ only had one daughter and that was Sayyida Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha and the other daughters didn't exist. Whereas if we take a look at the historical documents which are available to us we find unanimously, with the exception of one or two, that the Prophet ﷺ was given four daughters, namely Sayyida Zainab, Sayyida Ruqiyya, Sayyida Umm Kulthum, and Sayyida Fatima. Rudwanullah ta'ala alayhi na ajma'in. So it would be <coughs> causing grief to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. If we decrease the number and we say the Prophet only had one daughter and the other daughters didn't exist, how would the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam <coughs> That just because of some agenda that we want to prove that Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu had this unique blessing that Allah, ta Allah Ta'ala's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam married his daughter Fatima to Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu. This makes him unique, gives him a special privilege gives him superiority and privilege over the other sahaba -i kiram Just to prove this, we take the step and we negate the existence of the other daughters of the Prophet ﷺ. Is there more either and grief which we can cause to the Prophet ﷺ? Or for any other motive people use and say that the Prophet only had one daughter. So Alhamdulillah, as Ahlu Sunnah, Wal Jama'ah, it is our duty to explain the facts to people. So that when you hear these deviated people talking about such things, that you remember that the stance of the Ahlu Sunnah Wal Jama'ah is a stance not just based on historical accounts, but Alhamdulillah, the Aqaid, the creed of the Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah can be backed up not only by authentic sources and ahadith, but Alhamdulillah by the glorious Quran itself. Allah Azza wa Jal has stated in Surah Al Ahzab. يَا أَيُّهَا النَّبِيُّ قُلْ لِأَزْوَاجِكَ وَبَنَاتِكَ O Messenger, tell 
your azwaj. The word azwaj refers to the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We all know there was more than one wife. And the other word, وَبَنَاتِكَ And tell your daughters. And as I've mentioned before, banat is the plural of bint. It can't be according to the direct quotation from the Holy Quran that the Prophet ﷺ had one daughter. وَبَنَاتِكَ And tell your daughters. The eldest of these daughters was Sayyida Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha, who according to historians was born 10 years before the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam announced his prophethood. And she was married to her cousin, maternal cousin, Abu al-As. And when this marriage took place is not clear in the historical accounts. But after Rasulullah announced his prophethood and invited people towards Islam, Abu Al-As, his son-in-law, was from amongst those who didn't accept the Prophet invitation. So you had a situation where the Prophet's daughter is married to a mushrik and hence the enemies of Islam begin to question that how could Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam leave his daughter to be married to a mushrik it doesn't make sense in fact we find an injunction and a hukum in the Quran that a mushrik cannot be married <coughs> to a mu'mina. Their marriage ceases to exist. There's no such thing. These questions are posed. That why did she remain in marriage to Abu al-As? <coughs> To answer this question and to clarify the situation, we see that the marriage took place before the migration of the Prophet ﷺ to Medina al Munawwar. Marriage took place before. And this hukum, this injunction, this order which was revealed was revealed in Medina. It wasn't revealed in Mecca. It was revealed in Medina al Munawwara. And we all know that in what circumstances the Prophet ﷺ left Mecca. Very difficult circumstances. There was pressure. And it was hard for the Prophet ﷺ <coughs> to run things on his liking and he couldn't dictate affairs in fact the Prophet ﷺ was forced out of Mecca had to migrate to Medina <coughs> and we all know that the Prophet ﷺ migrated with his good friend Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq the rest of the family the Prophet's daughters and the rest of the people were left behind. And when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came into the city of Medina, Allah azza wa jal began to reveal the ayat, bayinat, which gave new instructions, new orders, new commandments. And day by day, the Islamic state was being established with new revelations coming in Islam was prospering rules were being introduced 
And after the Battle of Badr, in which Abu Al-As <coughs> participated, and he was captured, he was fighting for the Mushrikeen Makkah, for the Quraysh, he was captured. <coughs> and when he was captured, the Prophet ﷺ released him on this condition that he will go to Mecca and he will send his daughter Sayyida Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha to Medina. That he will release him on this condition that he goes to Mecca and sends his wife to Medina. So you see, the first possible opportunity for the Prophet ﷺ to dictate affairs and to demand something, the Prophet ﷺ used the situation. Abu Al-As promised. He said, you release me, let me go back to Mecca, I will send your daughter. I will send my wife to Medina. So, being a mushrik, nevertheless he was an honourable man. A man of his word. Something... We have to acknowledge that even the mushrikeen of Arab had in them. They were men of their word. If they said something, they stuck by what they said. And in modern day society, even this quality ceases to exist. People say something else, do something else. But even the mushrikeen, the idolaters, even they, Abu Al-As was in state of shirk. But he made a promise to the Prophet ﷺ that I will send your daughter when I get back to Mecca. And after reaching Mecca, he tells his brother Ganana to take Sayyida Zainab. And as they are leaving, Abu Sufyan, at the time, one of the leaders of the Quraysh, had yet not accepted Islam, he instructs that this caravan, this group must be obstructed. They must be stopped. How can we allow this? The daughter of Muhammad, our main enemy. How can they be leaving Mecca? Which tells you of how delicate and tough the situation was. That they felt that it was part of their power that they had the Prophet's daughter in their midst and she was living in Mecca. And now, this escape, which was happening before them, they would never tolerate. Abu Sufyan obstructs the caravan. It is mentioned in narrations that a spear was flung at Sayyidah Zainab. She was in a state of pregnancy. And this severely damaged her. She fell from her animal. Ganana says that my brother has promised Muhammad I have to send the Prophet's daughter. Abu Sufyan says that we, cannot, we can never allow this Muhammad's daughter to escape from Mecca. You have to wait because obviously Ganana was also part of the Meccan setup. He was also a member of the city of Mecca. So they had a dialogue and they decided that secretly, later on, they would allow Sayyidah Zainab anha to travel to Medina. So to cut this story short, there is a whole history regarding Sayyidah Zainab anha. And it's not like some people say that she didn't even exist and give Iza to Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She comes back to, or she comes to Medina. Abu al-As is in Mecca. The marriage is terminated. The marriage doesn't exist anymore. Later on, Abu al-As is captured again in another battle. And this time, when he is captured, Sayyidah Zainab, radiallahu ta'ala anha, pleads to her father to release him. He is released. He goes back to Medina, uh, to Mecca. And he gives his amanat, his 
things which were given to him to look after. And after finishing his affairs, he declares that he is a Muslim and he migrates to Medina al Munawwarah. So Abu Al-As became Abu Al-As radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He comes to Medina and the marriage takes place again and Sayyidah Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anhu is reunited with her husband who is Abu Al-As radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So Sayyidah Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha also had two children. One of them was called Ali who died and passed away when he was an infant. And the other was Sayyida Umama radiallahu ta'ala anha. She also has a history. And she was in fact married to Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala anha later on in life. So, to cut the message short, we as Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, our stance is very clear that we are not people who disrespect any of the links which exist with the Prophet whether it be his Sahaba Ikram, whether it be the Ahl Bayt, whether it be the Ummahatul Mu'mineen, whether it be the Banati Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they all deserve our utmost respect, affection. We should celebrate their names. We should speak about them and how much affection the Prophet ﷺ had with his daughters, with his granddaughters, with his grandchildren. And this